Hey all you scholars out there, it's Mikito, and today we're doing another double digit Q class for the Massachusetts Go Foundation, the MGF. Uh, we are going to finish up chapter two. Uh, chapter two is very long. Uh, in fact, this is probably one of the longest lectures I've, I will have to teach uh, because it has the most variations and most problems. Uh, so this took a very long time to compile, but let's get started. Uh, so last week we covered attacking for power, we covered attacking for territory, and we touched on running battles. So let's look at some other tools we can use to attack. Uh, the first example is it kind of a, a, a recap of what we learned. So if we look at A, a is to attack for territory, right? You can see that we're trying to build up a large moyo or territory on this side of the board. This is a good place to be. But if we do play A, then white's going to be able to come out, right? White's going to have a chance to escape. Um, and we can see that the more that white escapes, uh, the more this black group actually becomes very weak, right? And so the SA direction isn't that optimal, right? Now, B is attacking for power. So you can see that we have a weak group, and so we're strengthening our weak group while attacking white. But when we play B, this gives white the opportunity to play A. So even though we got a little stronger, it's very clear that white got also very powerful. So this attack you could call is a failure. Um, so we have to come up with our third option. This is a new technique. Um, it's been talked about before in many of my videos, um, but, you know, now we're going to learn it officially, right? It's called the indirect or more commonly known, the leaning attack. So if we lean on this white weak group here, right, we can see that this isn't fully strong yet. If we got in front of it, it would be painful. So white doesn't allow that then we keep leaning on it. We keep gaining strength from this. And once black is not worried about dying anymore, black can now come and play the aggressive move, right? And so you can see that by attacking white here, white still has a way to get out, but it's less damaging on our group, right? We can still work with this. Uh, the proverb that I use all the time in my reviews is to make noise in the West to attack in the East. It's a common proverb, leaning attacks, leaning against one group to strengthen yourself for an attack or another is a standard technique. This is very important to understand. I really like this example. All right, let us look at the next example. So now this is more of a problem than anything. If you guys want to pause the video, you can uh, try and answer it and see if you get it right. We have both A and B. Uh, remember what we're learning is the leaning attack, right? So let us look at the answer. A would be the correct answer because now if black plays here, white jumps out and black is like fully surrounded, right? Black has to attach here to try and live and it's gonna be a struggle. Even if black does live, you can see that white is getting a lot in the center, right? And so this power, this is attacking and gaining power. Um, so this is really nice for white. If black was to, let's say, play here, right? To try and cut these two groups. Well, now when white gets this move, these stones are dead. They can't get out, right? They're just gonna die. And so these were important cutting stones because now you see white gets out into the center and has no issues in the corner. So this is also extremely good for white. Uh, white kills important cutting stones if black ignores the leaning attack. And finally, so we can see that no matter what black chooses to do, white's gonna get a good result with this move. But when white plays here, Black now just is capable of splitting. If white jumps without the leaning attack, black cuts through the shape. Yeah, so this is the example where we can see that black will still be okay to cut through these, this group, uh, which wouldn't be good for white. And there's no pressure on this group on the bottom. So in a sense, uh, black has gotten the advantage here.
Let's see what's going on. Okay, so now we have another problem. Let's put this as problem. For black to move. Okay, so now A or B. Uh, guys, once again, if you want to pause it, feel free to. Uh, we're going to just keep barreling along. Uh, in this case, we have a weak black group and two white groups, or even a third one, if you want to call it. Uh, so black needs to find a way to attack these cutting stones, right? Being cut is not good. If we attack correctly, let's look at the correct answer first. If we lean on this group, we can see that white has two options, right? If white pushes this way to strengthen the group that got shoulder hit, we can see black becomes just significantly stronger. And now these stones are getting swallowed up, right? So black's gaining strength uh, by leaning on the white cutting stones. This is, I mean, <laughs> black's gaining strength by leaning on this group to attack the cutting stones. So this is really nice. If um, white sees that, right, and tries to protect this way, well, now when black uh, strengthens and hits and white has to run out, black breaks the tiger's mouth, and then black uh, leans on this group more. He takes the profit of leaning on this group. So already you can see that while black was in a defensive position, it's now changed into an offensive one. Uh, white is really damaged here. Black only needs one move to swallow the stone up. Um, and white is damaged here, right? Doesn't have two eyes and black is very strong here and black has a lot of running potential here. So this is going to be a fight in the center for sure. Okay, let's look at the next example. So this is another problem. Uh, how should black attack the bottom group, right? Uh, if you want to pause the video, go ahead now. Uh, we're going to barrel through. We're going to look through these variations. Um, so the correct answer, so this is the bottom group, and it's black's turn to attack. Uh, the correct answer is to play this leaning attack. Essentially, we're putting pressure on this stone and asking white if what white wants to do. If when white jumps out, then black can already profit. White will save its main group, but black has already scored um, a bigger profit by attacking and get sente. If white chooses to play this move, well, now black just plays this, and we can see that these stones are in real big trouble. They're going to have a very difficult time living. Um, and so black has already gained uh, its goal, right? It attacked in the west to, or it made noise in the west to attack in the east. And finally, if we, Hane, would see. This is only going to push black into a stronger position, right? And then black squeezes out like toothpaste. Um, so if white Han is at one, black gets much stronger, a much stronger attack. Uh, forcing black out like this is almost always wrong. So essentially, white still is in a lot of pain, right? White has a lot of troubles here. And white has some trouble here, right? Black can always Atari and take. And then black has already moved ahead in the race, too. So he's making good in, in the center. So this is very nice. All right. Let's look at the next example. So here we are. Uh, we can call this a problem. How to attack on the bottom side. Um, so for this white group, we see that... Uh, I'm going to put black to play and make this a little better. So in this bottom group, we see an attack target, right? So we, we have the capability to attack it. So we want to find the answer. You guys can pause it if you want. Uh, I'm going to keep going through. Uh, the first answer that comes out to me is A, right? And the reason is, is because this is a leaning attack against this white stone here. Uh, so white has two options, right? 
Uh, the correct option for white, the book says, is to jump out here. Because now you see black once again grabs profit while attacking and white is able to escape. This is very ideal for black and just generally good. Um, if white was to push this way, well now all it's doing is helping black get stronger against its weaker group. And so now you can see that when black gets this thousand dollar turn, um, white still has some issues. And then white has even more issues. Uh, this A attack is a very strong attack for black here. If black, uh, you know, if white doesn't defend itself. And also, there's just not a lot of territory for white here in the first place because black has a slide here. So you can see by gaining power, by leaning on this group, it's putting trouble on both sides for white. If white pushes black, this could create strength, which affects both sides of the board. Black has an attack at A and a slide at B. Brute force attacks are fine when they succeed. I should uh, write succeed correctly. When they succeed. And awful when they fail. Leaning attacks has a lot less risk. So essentially, if you're trying to brute force kill something, like your whole game will rely on this kill, then it's going to be a hard game, right? You're either going to win or lose from it. Uh, depending on if the attack's successful. But when we use leaning attacks, they're far less risky, right? We, we usually just gain profit without much risk. And so that's why leaning attacks are really good. Um, leaning attacks are the essence of go. Attacking and manipulating your opponents, surrounding them from afar, and gaining profit while you do it. So, yeah, that's essentially it. Um, you get to manipulate your opponents um, and surround them from afar, right? You can see these black stones aren't touching this group. So we're trying to surround it from afar. And we gain profit while we do it. So leaning attack, guys. Add this to your tool set. It's a very important high-level concept to understand. Um, I think it's easy to understand, but you have to keep your eyes out on it constantly. Our eyes out for it, I should say. All right, so now we're going to our next concept. <clears throat> we've covered running battles. We've covered indirect attacks, such as leaning attacks. Now we're talking about straight up divide and conquer. Uh, the basic idea is to keep your opponent split. By splitting your opponents, you can create double attacks. A is the wrong direction, right? If we're attacking this way, uh, all it's going to do is help white connect to its other group. And with all these liber liberties, it becomes pretty much indestructible. Um, so it's much better for us to separate the group with B. Uh, if white tries to connect, well, let's look at both. So let's look at white's best option, I guess. Uh, the first one would be to run like this. But now you see that black just jumps up. White's already very vulnerable here. And white still doesn't have two eyes here. So there's lots of vulnerability with this group. <clears throat> if white gets split, if he tries to save the bottom, it hurts the top. That's essentially what happens here once you split these two groups. Now, if white tries to save the top, well, it's only going to hurt the bottom, right? You can see that this group is now starting to become more surrounded, and black is doing a good job. If white tries to help the top, the bottom group is now in trouble. Let's look at another example. Okay, how should black split the white groups? All right, black. You can pause it here if you want to try. Um, I'm going to, you know, keep going. So uh, when black plays here, this is a very good way to split both groups. If black doesn't split here, white has the option to um, connect under here with a move here. So black plays something like this. And now you can see this is undercutting kind of both bases. And so if white runs on this side, then black can just keep splitting. And we have a problem for uh, the bottom for white. Black is damaging both sides of these groups at the same time. Black can continue with a leaning attack at A, 
So the idea is that, yes, this move is favoring attacking the whites on the bottom, but black still has a great follow-up with the leaning attack here, an attachment on the top to attack this part. So both groups are in trouble. If black doesn't split, white couldn't have connected at B. Yeah, so if white, black doesn't play any move to split these groups, then white can attach on the bottom, take this, uh, uh, and connect both groups. This is a full board example. How should black split A and B? So, um, yeah, how should black split A and B? Uh, this is a good example, right? So if you want to pause the video, you can try to find the move. Uh, I'm going to give the answer now. Uh, so the answer is L5. Essentially, when you have two weak groups like this, sometime and they're this close it's good to play just directly in between them because now if white protects itself then black just pushes up and then we can see playing between the middle of them is the best way to divide and to conquer uh, both groups become significantly weak er. uh, if white chose any other move let's say if white just i don't know tried to strengthen itself like this or something Black can play here, and now this becomes a false eye. So this is why white chose to push at k5 in the game. Um, so yeah, that's mainly it. Uh, so I like this example of dividing, right? You always want to keep your opponent split. This is what I tell my students, especially in handicap games, because you have all the power, so you should keep your opponent split apart. Uh, let us move to the next example. This was a game between Go Sagan and Kitani. Um, the problems for black, so I put a white stone here because I needed, this wasn't a part of the game, obviously. Um, so I needed black to move. So uh, if you want to pause the video, you can try and find the first move that helps black split um, important groups. Um, so go ahead and try that now. For me, I'll give the answer right now, which is N7. Uh, I actually found this question a bit hard, even though the answer is really simple. Um, the follow-up moves, of course, become hard to find for me. Um, so white protects this side, and black fully separates the two. Uh, white continues to try and balloon to protect this side, and black continues to attack this weak group. White fixes its weak group. Black does this you know, cool attachment that seems like out of nowhere to me, but I understand that strengthening these stones will help the fight with this, so that makes complete sense. And then black once again splits, does the splitting move, right? Splitting these two groups. Uh, Gosegan did not kill either side, but this attack helped take the initiative and win the game. Uh, keeping your opponent split is very important. Keep your opponent split. That's what this game is showing. All right, let's see. So now playing directly between the true groups doesn't do much, right? In the other example, we saw that if we played on the middle line between the two weak groups, then we uh, would split them apart and it would be really good, right? But in this case, this weak group and this weak group is far apart. And so if we just tried splitting them now, it would look silly, right? It's not going to do too much. Um, so we need to learn one of the funnest techniques. I think this is, I, I, I remember I was able to do this during a tournament, um, the New York uh, tournament in 2021. It was the summer tournament, I believe. Um, I got to do this against a 3K, and it felt so good like to drive your opponents into each other and then split them. So in this case, if we uh, undercut white here, white can't make uh, two eyes under here. So white's option is to run out. Now we have find a move, right, to try and corral white into coming down this way. 
and we continue to do so. And as soon as we get this option, uh, we uprooted the enemy and guided the sheep to their pen, right? That's what we're trying to do, trying to be uh, sheep dogs. Now this is the time to split, right? They're very close together, and so now we can play a splitting move. This move is the important striking move. A and B turn into me I. <clears throat> so once we play this, you can see it is generally dangerous to have two weak groups on the board. Uh, this is to have, I'm going to change this two to a W, two. <laughs> we can see if white saves its large group on the top, black profits on the bottom, taking these stones very easily when black becomes strong enough. Um, so, yeah, generally having two weak groups on the board is usually a bad thing. Uh, it's very, very dangerous. And I think in my latest games, I've been making bad cuts, which then create two weak groups, and then which gets me in a lot of trouble. I think this has been a, a staple in my recent games. Um, so I need to fix that and clean that up. But, yeah, this is a really cool example. And I think it's like once you actually pull something like this off you feel like a tactical genius um it, it's it really does feel good so the, the funnest thing you can do in go in my opinion uh is corralling your opponents around into each other and then splitting them at the last moment uh so let's see here so now we are moving on to cuts. And I got to tell you, when I was reading the book, and then I read it, read it, it, I wrote it, I read it. <laughs> I read the book twice, right? I read it the first time, and then I read it the second time to translate it onto, you know, an OGS video here. Um, and I still got a lot of the problems wrong. So my biggest weakness, I think, is not understanding or the cuts, right? I'm not evaluating them right, or something's going on. But th this is probably one of my weakest parts of the game, is knowing when to cut and where. Um, so in this case, to me, it's obvious. But in some of the problems, I have a lot of trouble. So guys, if you want to try and answer this, uh, which cut do you think is better? Uh, go ahead and pause the video if you want. And then, you know, I'm going to move on. So here's the answer. Uh, A is the better cut. Right, because you can see that it actually makes both these groups very weak. This is kind of the strongest version of divide and conquer, right? Because there's no way that these two groups can get any closer without you splitting them, right? Um, without them connecting. So this is a part of the divide and conquer, and the tool is the cut. Um, once black strengthens the bottom, it's going to hurt the top. You can clearly see. Uh, it's a devastating cut that makes A and B me I, right? Depending on for white, whichever one white's going to get, it's going to be super beneficial for white. Black may lose one group or the other. Um, so what if we play... What if we play... Let me just see if there's something else here. Okay, yeah, yeah. So we played A, right? So let's see B. If B strengthens this group on the top, we can see white just Ataris connects. And now this group doesn't look like it has enough room for eyes. This is going to get really damaged and probably die. Um, black dies below and black on top is still not out of hot water. The idea is that this group is still in a lot of trouble. All right. So now let's look at the cut at B. If we were to play B, I think black would just gladly sacrifice these two stones to get a stronger position on the outside here. Uh, not all cuts are good. If you cut off something that black can give away, this will only help your opponent strengthen themselves. You guys see that black has become a lot stronger and white got turned into itself, only got two captures. <clears throat> So cutting is a very valuable skill. Uh, let's see. 
So in this case, um, my mind goes right to splitting these two up, right? This is where uh, I fail sometimes. Um, and the book has really shown me that. So in this case, if we look, uh, it's much more effective to push your opponents together than to split them apart. Sometimes, right? In this case, it's very clear, I think. So we'll look at the bad answer first and then the good one. So the bad answer would be to attach here, right? Uh, because what's going to happen is white's going to hane and you cross cut, right? Oops, let me just delete that. So you cross cut, but now white just uses all the free moves and becomes really strong. So white has gained a lot of strength and connection and out into the center more, while black just captured one stone. So trying to hack and cut here leaves black and gote and white in a much better position. So instead, it's much better to play something like this, which is threatening to surround the whole group. White connects to its stone, but now you can undercut it here. And so this almost looks like a yin-yang type of uh, position here, right? Because you have black on like both sides of the white, and then white's on both sides of the black. But um, if black pushes the group together, white is in a lot more trouble, while black profits. There is a big difference between a good cut and a bad cut. Uh, and I have trouble finding the difference myself personally. Uh, we can look at some more examples, so let's take a look. I did have a lot of trouble um, at this part of the book uh, myself. All right, the question is, should black cut? Let's say, um, should black cut here or play another move somewhere else? Uh, you guys can pause the video if you want to try. I'm going to move on. Uh, so the correct answer is A. And this is actually a very good cut because both these stones are pretty important, right? Uh, black is an ideal cut. White doesn't want to surrender either side, right? This is painful for white on either side. Um, so black one aims, once, uh, once black extends here, it aims at either hitting A or B. So it creates Mi, which is really nice for black. Um, so white's in trouble. Let's look at another problem. White to play the cut at A or no. So is this a good cut? That's the first question. Uh, you have to read it out. So like read it in your, your head. Feel free to pause the video. Um, and then find, if it's not a good cut, then what should be the next answer, right? You can try and find the next answer, which I have some markers down. Um, so let's look at the A cut, right? So let's look if white cuts. Uh, this is, you know, spoiler alert, it's actually a bad cut, right? So now what's going to happen is black's going to give up these stones. And then you can see black's outside has become significantly stronger. So he's given up a little to gain a lot, right? Black gives up the stones to take a strong moy on the side. This is bad for white and can threaten A, right? So black actually has a move here which would then threaten to seal in white here, which is really nice for black. Uh, there was two options. White could push this way, but the same thing's gonna, gonna happen, right? We're gonna see that black sacrifices these stones, but takes a very strong position um, on the outside. And this is even stronger than the last position. Um, so black had to sacrifice another stone for it, but this is really nice for black. Too nice, too nice. All right, is it worth cutting? So once again, we're asked if this cut is worth it. Um, you know, take the time to read it out. Uh, you know, pause the video if you need to, uh, because I'm gonna go through the answers quickly. Um, let us discuss the cut first. If this cut is not good, then, you know, of course, look at the other moves and see what you prefer. Uh, first, we will discuss the cut because the cut is the right answer. Once we cut here and black makes good shape, black takes away white's liberties. 
White has to try and gain more liberties, and then Black finishes this cutting position. And so now, without even markers, although this, let me just say, although this only cuts one stone, this corner becomes quite big, right? If Black is able to kill this white group. So we can see that, I'll put markers down even though they were in the book. I think that this stone is aiming for a seal heel, right? To seal this in. Or, I don't know the perfect moves to seal this in, but this is hitting a vital point. It looks important to me, I'm not sure. Um, maybe <laughs> well i wish the book put down some markers but i would say that this still looks very strong against these stones maybe even uh i really like this vital point here so i'm gonna say like b um so yeah this looks really good for black this is a good cut so any of these other moves don't are inefficient right if we let white connect all right, let's look at the next example. We're getting close to the end. It was actually a little more, just a very little more to chapter two, but uh, these, 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 doing this takes a very long time. So uh, I had to end it uh, when it got too late. All right, so black two play the cut. Um, so we have to ask ourselves, should black play the cut? Uh, pause the video and let me know, you know, or let yourself know what you think. It's a lot of uh, reading involved, so let's ask if we should play the cut. Uh, I'm going to continue on. So the answer is actually C, which is not to allow the cut. When I looked at this, my first thought was we should play this, right? Like we should try and just squeeze these stones and try and get this underside. But this isn't in the book, and I just feel like it doesn't work that well. Uh, B, this cut looks really dangerous. Um, I don't... Let's see. So if B cuts, then white's just going to jump here. It's going to ignore these these stones right now and just you know, put pressure on the corner. And so the corner becomes very small, possibly dead. And white is starting to build a base in here, right? Which would destroy a lot of black points. Um, so white ignores the cut and puts pressure on the corner with a good invasion. Um, so the answer is C. Because now, once white plays this, this is very hard to find, guys. Um, I wouldn't expect you guys to get the right answer. Um, I sure didn't. I'll tell you that. I didn't see any of this coming. So black plays here, getting cut, and now white has to spend the time to kill these stones. And so we use these stones as a squeezing sacrifice to now get a very solid amount of territory on this side. This is a really cool variation that when you see it, it's like, oh yeah, this is really good. But to find that we needed to sacrifice these stones now, I think is very difficult to, to get the squeeze. Um, that is just my opinion though. If you guys found it, very good job. All right, and we're on the last problem. Problem, should black cut? So we're looking at A, B, C. Um, should black place the cut here? Feel free to pause the video. I'm going to give the answer now. I thought black should cut. It looks like there's a weakness here. These stones are weak. It looks good to me. Answer is no. You shouldn't cut. White strengthens. Hits the head of two stones. Black gets to kill these stones. <laughs> Excuse me. Black gets to kill these stones uh, here on the, the top. But white has become significantly stronger. Um, and so this position looks really good for white. Uh, so instead, what black should do is play here. And this was a nice example of the previous chapters we went over, which is to try and attack to make profit, right? We can see once we attack from this direction, this group of Moyo is starting to become a thing. 
Um, so essentially the book recommended us to attack white as a whole instead of cutting it apart. Um, so we should push our groups together, just like in the previous example. Uh, black should fight white groups as a whole. He can't kill white, but he is building a large moy on the middle. Yeah, so this is a really nice combo, right? This is a nice looking at the board less locally and more globally. Um, I really like this problem. And this is the last problem of the lecture, guys. Um, so this pretty much ends chapter two. There's, if you check out the book yourselves, there's one more problem and like, I don't know, six or seven more diagrams. Um, but I think this is a good place to stop now. Next week, we will be working on chapter three. And I appreciate you guys watching this. So I hope you have a good day. I hope this helps and take it easy.